congratulate Secretary of State John Kerry and the President for working on this agreement. As you've indicated, what is happening in Syria, the number of people, the hundreds of thousands of people who have been killed, men, women, 20,000 children, the people are forced to flee their own countries, uh, their own country. Uh, it is unspeakable. It is a real horror. Now, what I think is that right now, uh, we have got to do our best in developing positive relations with Russia. But let's be clear. Russia's aggressive actions in the Crimea, Crimea and in Ukraine have brought about a situation where President Obama and NATO, correctly, I believe, are saying, you know what, we're going to have to beep up uh, our troop level uh, in that part of the world to tell Putin that his aggressiveness uh, is not going to go uh, unmatched, that he is not going to get away with aggressive action. Uh, I happen to believe that Putin is doing what he is doing because his economy is increasingly in shambles and is trying to rally his people in support of him. But bottom line is the president is right. We have to put more money. We have to work with NATO to protect Eastern Europe against any kind of Russian aggression. Well, with respect to Syria, I really do um, appreciate the efforts that Secretary Kerry has made. Uh, the agreement on humanitarian relief now needs to be implemented because there are enclaves uh, that are literally filled with starving people uh, throughout Syria. The agreement on a ceasefire, though, is something that has to be implemented more quickly than the schedule that the Russians agreed to. You know, the Russians wanted to buy time. Are they buying time to continue their bombardment on behalf of the Assad regime to further decimate uh, what's left of the opposition, uh, which would be a grave uh, disservice uh, to any kind of eventual ceasefire? So I know Secretary Kerry is working extremely hard to try to move that ceasefire up as quickly as possible. <laughs> but I would add this, you know, the Security Council finally got around to adopting a resolution. At the core of that resolution is an agreement I negotiated in June of 2012 in Geneva, which set forth a <coughs> ceasefire and moving toward a political uh, resolution, trying to bring the parties at stake in Syria together. This is incredibly complicated because we've got Iran as a big player in addition to Russia, we have Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and others who have very important interests in their view. This is one of the areas I've disagreed with Senator Sanders on, who has called for Iranian troops uh, trying to end the civil war in Syria, which I think would be a grave mistake. Putting Iranian troops right on the border of the Golan, right next to Israel, would be a non-starter for me. Trying to get Iran and Saudi Arabia to work together, as he has suggested in the past, is it equally a non-starter. So let's support what Secretary Kerry and the President are doing, but let's hope that we can accelerate the ceasefire because I fear that the Russians will continue their bombing, try to do everything they can to destroy what's left of the opposition. And remember, the Russians have not gone after ISIS or any of the other terrorist groups. So as we get a ceasefire and maybe some humanitarian corridors, that still leaves the terrorist groups on the doorstep of others in Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and the like. So we've got some real work to do, and let's try to make sure we actually implement what has been agreed to with the Russians. Let me just, just say this. Um, for a start, the Secretary and I disagree, and I think the President uh, does not agree with her, in terms of the concept of a no-fly zone in Syria. Uh, I think you do have a humanitarian tragedy there, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, I applaud Secretary Kerry and the President for trying to put together this agreement. Let's hope that it holds. But furthermore, what we have got to do, I'm sorry, yeah, I do believe that we have got to do everything that we can, and it will not happen tomorrow. But I do hope that in years to come, just as occurred with Cuba, 10, 20 years ago, people said, reach normalized relations with Cuba. And by the way, I hope we can end the trade embargo with Cuba as well. But the idea that we someday maybe have decent relations with Iran, maybe put pressure on them 
so they end their support for terrorism around the world? Yeah, that is something I want to achieve. And I believe that the best way to do that is to be aggressive, to be principled, but to have the goal of trying to improve relations. That's how you make peace in the world. You sit down and you work with people. You make demands of people. In this case, demanding Iran stop the support of international terrorism. Well, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I think we have achieved a great deal with the Iranian nuclear agreement to put a lid on the uh, Iranian nuclear weapons program. That has to be enforced absolutely with consequences for Iran at the slightest deviation from their requirements under the agreement. I do not think we should promise or even look toward normalizing relations because we have a lot of other business to get done with Iran. Yes, they have to stop being the main state sponsor of terrorism. Yes, they have to stop trying to destabilize the Middle East, causing even more chaos. Yes, they've got to get out of Syria. They've got to quit uh, sponsoring Hezbollah and Hamas. They've got to quit trying to ship rockets into Gaza that can be used against Israel. We have a lot of work to do with Iran before we ever I say would, that they well, could move toward normalized relations a, with us. We, a, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. But I recall when Secretary Clinton ran against then Senator Obama. She was critical of him for suggesting that maybe you want to talk to Iran, that you want to talk to our enemies. I have no illusion. Of course you're right. Iran is sponsoring terrorism in many parts of the world, destabilizing areas. Everybody knows that. But our goal is, in fact, to try over a period of time to, in fact, deal with our enemies, not just ignore them. But if you get a quote me, Senator Sanders, from a debate final, in 2008, quote what I said, the question was, would you meet with an adversary without conditions? I said no. And in fact, in the Obama administration, we did not meet with anybody without conditions. That is the appropriate approach in order to get the results that you are seeking. <laughs> no, I think the idea was that President, then Senator Obama was wrong for suggesting that it's a good idea to talk to your opponents. It's easy to talk to your friends. It's harder to talk to your enemies. I think we should do both. Let me move on. You have both mentioned the humanitarian tragedies, which have been an outgrowth and part of what's happened in Syria and in Libya. More than a million refugees entered Europe in 2015. Another 76,000 just last month. That's about 2,000 arrivals every day. Nearly 400 people have been lost at sea so far this year, crossing the Mediterranean. And there are reports that 10,000 children are missing. If we are leaders in this world, where should the U.S. be on this? What should the United States be doing, Secretary Clinton? Well, I was pleased that NATO announced uh, just uh, this week that they're going to start doing patrols uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean, to try to interdict the, smuggler, uh, the smugglers, to try to prevent the kind of tragedies that we have seen all too often. Uh, also, to try to prevent more refugees from coming uh, to the European Union, and it's especially significant that they are working with both Turkey and Greece in order to do this. With respect to the United States, I think our role in NATO, our support for the EU, as well as our willingness to take refugees so long as they are thoroughly vetted uh, and that we have confidence from intelligence and other uh, sources that they uh, can come to our country, we should be doing our part. And we should back up the recent donors conference to make sure we have made our contribution to try to deal with the enormous cost that these refugees are posing uh, to Turkey and to members of the EU in particular. This is a humanitarian catastrophe. There's no other, ex no other description of it. So we do, as the United States, have to support our friends, our allies in Europe we have to stand with them. We have to provide financial support to them. We have to provide the NATO support uh, to back up the mission that is going on. And we have to uh, take properly vetted refugees ourselves. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to go on a congressional uh, delegation. And I went to uh, one of these Turkish border of Syria. And what a sad sight that was. Men, women, uh, children forced out of their homes. Uh, and Turkey, by the way, 
uh, did a very decent thing okay. providing what was reasonable housing and conditions uh, for those people. Uh, it seems to me that given our history as a nation that has been a beacon of hope for the oppressed, for the downtrodden, that I very strongly disagree with those Republican candidates who say, you know what, we've got to turn our backs on women and children who left their home with nothing, nothing at all. That is not what America is supposed to be about. So I believe that working with Europe, and by the way, you know, we got some very wealthy countries there in that part of the world. You got Kuwait, and you got Qatar, and you got Saudi Arabia. They have a responsibility as well. But I think this is a worldwide, uh, that the entire world needs to come together to, to deal with this horrific uh, refugee crisis uh, we're seeing from Syria and Afghanistan as well. And we have a final question from our Facebook family, uh, and it goes to Senator Sanders. Um, it comes from Robert Andrews. He's a 40-year-old stay-at-home dad in Dover, Massachusetts. He says, the world has seen many great leaders in the course of human history. Can you name two leaders, one American and one foreign, who would influence your foreign policy decisions? And why do you see them as, why are they influential? You know, Franklin 